Ahoy there! Captain Benzie here, coming at you with another episode of the Frigate Pilots Manifesto, the series that aims to teach you everything you'll need to know to become a dedicated frigate pilot in EVE Echoes. Now today we're going to be doing another deep dive into the Tech 8 Interceptor Frigates, this time around by having a look at the Galente Federation's Atron Interceptor, this unusual looking ship on the screen now. And let's give it some, you know, some, some credit here. As far as Galente ships go, the Atron isn't one of the worst. Yeah, its design is a little bit problematic to me, notably the sort of droopy dro uh, dog face here at the front, which is actually where the capsule is loaded, apparently, according to the uh, Frigates of Eve Online book, right down there in sort of that silver front section is where the uh, capsule is actually loaded and undocked each time, but let's be fair, as far as Galente frigates go, this one isn't the worst. What we're going to be doing today, is essentially then, is having a deep dive into this ship. We'll have a look at its stats and explore what those actually all mean, what it means to be an interceptor, and we'll have a look at different ways that you can fit this for various different tasks, because the Atron Interceptor is actually a really interesting ship in that it has a very powerful non-combat role as well, which we will look at in a moment. Now, like the other episodes in the Frigate Pilots Manifesto, this video does kind of expect you to have gone through the Catskull Academy playlist of lessons. I will expect you to understand terms like prop, the difference between micro warp drives and afterburners, things like how your capacitor works, how turrets work, all that jazz. So if you haven't already like familiarized yourself with the Catskull Academy playlist, take this opportunity now, click the link in the top right or in the description down below and watch through all of those to make sure you are completely up to date. Now, if you do enjoy this video, let me know by hitting like on it, sub to the channel for all things Eve Echoes, ding that notification bell so that you never miss an upload, and let me know in the comment section down below what ships you want to see me cover in future videos, what topics you want me to cover in future videos, all of that as well. Finally, if you do want to go the extra mile to help support this channel, you can do so by joining us on Patreon. Details are on screen now. That all said and done then, let's talk about the Atron Interceptor. The Atron Interceptor is the Galente Federation's answer to the Tech 8 Interceptor frigates. Of course, it follows that line of having the standard Atron at Tech Level 2, and the ever-popular Atron 2 at Tech Level 4. Very popular frigate, very powerful, so I know a lot of you are interested in knowing more about the Atron Interceptor, found up here at Tech Level 8. Again, not the ugliest ship out there, I do quite like the view from behind on this one, and from above, certainly the profile of the wings there, I don't mind that it's asymmetrical, it is literally just that weird canopy at the front there, a sort of droopy dog face that just, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I just wish that was a little bit more rounded off. Now, at this point, I would normally go into the attributes and fittings and talk about what makes the Atron Interceptor unique. Rather than that, though, I, I want to start by having a look at what makes an Interceptor an Interceptor, because that is a key part of understanding the Atron Interceptor and all its different applications. First and foremost is that roll bonus, ever important roll bonus, plus one warp disrupt field immunity level. What this means is that the Atron Interceptor, like the other Interceptors, is completely, totally and utterly immune to all forms of interdictor spheres and bubbles. Whether that is a sphere launched through an interdiction sphere launcher from something like a Thrasher Interdictor or a Coercer Interdictor, or whether that is a warp disruption field generated by a warp disruption field generator attached to one of the cruiser level interdictors like the Bellicose or the Arbitrator. Uh, the Bellicose or the Arbitrator Interdictor. Any form of warp bubble, the inter Interceptor frigates are completely immune to them. And yes, they are immune to multiple of them. This has been tested. You can stack three, four, five different bubbles on top of the same spot, put the Interceptor in the middle, and it can still comfortably warp out which makes it completely immune to gate camping with interdictor bubbles. You can, of course, still be locked. You can be locked down by warp disruptors and warp scramblers. As long as they've obviously got enough points to destabilize you, then you will still be locked down, but you are completely immune to interdiction spheres of all kinds. Now, like the other Interceptors as well, the Atron Interceptor gets bonuses both from Advanced Electronic Warfare and Advanced Frigate Command. Now, the Advanced Electronic Warfare bonus is the same across all four of the Interceptor Frigates, whether that's the Atron, the Condor, the Executioner, or the Slasher Interceptor up here at Tech 8. They all have this same bonus, which is a plus 3% increase to Warp Disruptor Optimal Range, a plus 3% increase to Warp Scrambler Optimal Range, and a 15% reduction to Warp Drive Signature Radius Penalty Micro warp drive signature radius penalty. I don't know why they've missed out that little bit of that, but there we are. 
all four of these uh, Interceptor Frigates have this same bonus, meaning if you have Advanced Electronic Warfare trained all the way to level 5, that is a 15% increase to the optimal range both of your Warp Disruptors and your Warp Scramblers, which is a key point we'll talk about in a second, and you get a 75% reduction to the Micro Warp Drive Signature Radius penalty as well, which is another key point with these Interceptors. Now, the, the thing to notice here is that that Warp Drive Signature Radius penalty means you're still going to get the full speed boost of having a Micro Warp drive activated, whilst you ba barely get any of the penalty to your signature radius for having it activated. This means that you can actually speed tank quite comfortably with a micro warp drive if you wish to. You do need to be aware, however, um, that in doing so, if you're fitting a micro warp drive, obviously any warp scrambler that hits you will switch that micro warp drive off instantly. This isn't like the Atron 2 or the Condor 2, etc., that get bonuses to afterburners. Yes, webs can really hurt those by slowing them down. Here, a single scrambler shuts your micro warp drive off completely, which takes you cr crashing all the way from what? 3,600 meters per second, I think this ship can get with a micro warp drive active, all the way down to about 500 meters per second. It's a humongous drop that cu uh, completely cuts off your speed tank well worth remembering. That's why the Warp Scrambler optimal range is really useful here, because if you decide to go for a ranged build with an Atron Interceptor or any of the other Interceptors, you can orbit outside of their Scrambler range whilst still hitting with your Scrambler. Obviously, you just need to be aware of what type of Scrambler they have. If you've both got a Mark V Warp Scrambler, you will be able to outrange theirs and continue to use your Micro Warp Drive. Key point to remember. Now, all of the Interceptors get a bonus to Advanced Frigate Command. This is usually tied into the weapon that they use. In this case, with the Atron Interceptor, that's a 7.5% increase to small railgun accuracy falloff and a 10% increase to small railgun damage. 50% increase to damage, 37.5% increase to small railgun accuracy falloff. Ultimately, that just means that your uh, any small railguns that you have fitted are going to do more damage and you can apply better from a little bit further range. A key point there in one of the main builds that I will be showcasing with the Atron Interceptor. Now, looking at the actual attributes and fittings of this ship, you can see that it shares its fitting profile with all of the other Interceptor frigates and indeed with the Faction frigates. It's all the threes across the board. Three high slots, three mid slots, three low slots, three power grid rigs and three mechanical rigs. Interestingly to note here though as well, the Atron Interceptor has a fairly solid power grid of 55 megawatts. That is a considerable increase over the Condor and Slasher Interceptors that both only have 39 and that can actually cause them problems with fittings. The Atron Interceptor, you can comfortably fit it with pretty much anything you want to as long as it's small modules, but again, we're getting ahead of ourselves there. The cargo hold capacity is a point that I do actually want to draw your attention to here and is one of the key aspects with the Atron Interceptor. 290 cubic meters and you've got three mechanical rigs. Remember that in the mechanical rigs you can start fitting what are called cargo hold optimization rigs. Now with three cargo hold optimization rig twos I think it worked out to 812 cubic meters which is not bad at all for a ship that is very fast, very hard to lock onto and cannot be shut down by interdictor spheres. Perfect for cargo running in and out of Nullsec if you're worried about getting caught in, uh, in, in a bubble gate camp. Of course, now that we're all at tech level 8 as well, you can actually start fitting the, uh, the tier 3 variants of the cargo hold optimization rigs, and I think you can actually push that up even higher. It means if you're going to be using an HRL Interceptor as a cargo runner, you don't actually necessarily need to train any skills at all or fit anything to it. Literally, grab the HRL Interceptor, fit the three cargo hold rigs, and then just fill it up with your cargo and autopilot back home. That simple, that powerful. Defensively speaking, the Atron Interceptor really doesn't have much going for it at all. 2,180. It's not the worst of the Interceptors, but tanking isn't really something that you're worried about with these. If you look at that shield, 521 is absolutely pathetic, alongside armor and structure of 628 and 641 respectively. Yeah, okay, there's a bit more armor and a bit more structure there, but quite frankly, if you're getting hit in an Atron Interceptor, you're kind of doing it wrong. The tank is a secondary fallback in case things go wrong. Looking further down here, you can see when we're talking about speed tanking, the signature radius and the flight velocity obviously pay an important part in that. Here you can see signature radius 27.8 meters is a very small signature radius indeed, and a flight velocity of 457 meters per second. Now, of course, this ship isn't getting any bonuses to the afterburner like the H12 did. 
but it is a high enough natural flight velocity that with enough skills in uh, frigate, uh, frigate Command and in Afterburner Operation, you can quite comfortably speed tank with an Afterburner on this as well. So it's up to you whether you go for the Micro Warp Drive or the Afterburner, or indeed both. Again though, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Finally then, a scan resolution of 902 is pretty high. This is not the highest of the, uh, the Interceptor frigates, but it does mean you can lock on very quickly to a target, and if you were to be fitting things like uh, the, uh, the rigs that can increase scan resolution, you can push that well over a thousand meters scan resolution, which makes this a surprisingly useful frigate for gate camping, or just for playing uh, tackle point in a fleet engagement, which of course, with the name Interceptor, is exactly what you'd expect from it. But then, let's go across and have a look at the skills. I've mentioned before in this series that I genuinely believe that every single pilot in EVE Echoes, regardless of what you normally do, whether you're an industrialist, whether you're a combat pilot, whatever it is you're normally used to flying, everyone should have skills in Frigate Command, getting Frigate Command at least to level 5. And ships like the Atrial Interceptor here are exactly why. Even if you're only using this as a nullsec cargo runner um, in order to use those interdictor bonuses to avoid the bubbles, ultimately, Frigate Command 5 gives you that increase to your flight velocity and a decrease to the inertia modifier. That means that you can achieve warp much quicker. You jump through a gate, you're in an interdiction sphere, the uh, interceptor bonus completely ignores that, you align very quickly indeed, and you can warp out of there with a cargo hold of greater than 800 cubic meters. Very powerful frigate, and I do recommend having Frigate Command trained to 5 in order to make that possible. Obviously, the ship itself doesn't actually get any direct bonuses to that skill. Advanced Frigate Command is the one that gives it the bonus. So if you are, like me, training into uh, frigates as a combat pilot, then Advanced Frigate Command 5 is an absolutely vital skill for the Atron Interceptor. Of course, that's giving us a 7.5% increase to the accuracy falloff and a 10% increase to small railgun damage um, on top of the inertia modifier reduction and frigate velocity increase. But both of those are still very important skills. That inertia modifier helps you maintain a tighter orbit and the frigate velocity means that you are able to accelerate, obviously you've got a higher top speed. Inertia modifier actually affects your acceleration, your deceleration and your turning circle as well. Very, very useful skill, plus the fact that it's increasing the damage from the ship's weapons, obviously very important. Now, secondly, obviously, if you're flying one of these ships, the ele advanced electronic warfare skill is absolutely vital too. Here, the, the naked stat itself gives a reduction to warp scrambler capacitor need, an increase to energy neutralizer optimal range, and energy neutralizer accuracy fall off. But the most important aspect is the fact that the ship itself is getting bonuses out of it. If you want to be using a micro warp drive on your interceptor, this skill is absolutely vital to reach level 5 with. There is a big difference between having Having, uh, advanced Electronic Warfare 4 and getting a 60% reduction to the Signature Radius penalty and having Advanced Electronic Warfare 5 and having that full 75% Signature Radius penalty. Big, big difference that makes whether or not you have the Micro Warp Drive on and um, whether or not you are a viable speed tank with the Micro Warp Drive is entirely hinging on this skill. The rest of the bonuses that you get for levelling it up aren't particularly huge towards an Interceptor. Obviously if you're using this as a tackle frigate then the ability to use Stasis Webifiers, Warp Disrupt at a lower cost of capacitor is nice and if you are using this in combat then having the energy Nosferatu optimal range and accuracy fall off does also help you out a little bit. It's not huge, not huge, it's not really relevant to the ship but it does, it has its use this is what I'm trying to say. Now obviously again navigation is a key skill tree here for the interceptors, whether that's going into micro warp drive operation for the ability to uh, reduce the cost of your capacitor whilst increasing its activation time and increasing the boost that you get from it. Now, the way I like to describe this here with the warp drive capacitor need and the warp drive activation time, imagine you pay your landlord 500 pound every four weeks as rent. That is kind of what it's like activating a micro warp drive. Now here with this skill, you are increasing the time between payments whilst decreasing the cost of those payments. So rather than £500 every four weeks, you're, pay you're paying £450 
every five weeks, which is a massive saving over a period of time. And in combat, obviously, that means you can leave that micro warp drive running for longer, and you get, of course, that 15% additional flight velocity boost to it as well. Now, advanced afterburner is very much the same kind of thing. 15% reduction to afterburner capacitor need, 15% increase to afterburner activation time, and a 15% increase to afterburner velocity bonus. If you're using an afterburner on an interceptor, this is a key skill that will allow you to push into uh, high enough speeds that you are speed tanking effectively, despite the fact that the ship itself does not get afterburner bonuses like the tier 4 tackle frigates do, like the Condor 2, the H12, that kind of thing. Now, beyond this as well, you could look into things like shield, armor, and defense uh, upgrades here. Not overly vital on an Atron Interceptor. Again, the aim of the game is to not get hit in the first place, so who cares if you've got good shield and armor skills, because you shouldn't really need to use them. Same with the frigate defense upgrades. Nice skills to have because they give you more hit points across the board, but if you're not getting hit, kind of useless. Engineering, though, is where things start to become very important again. We get an increase to the capacitor capacity of all your frigates, an increase to the power grid of all your frigates, and we reduce the capacitor required to activate your warp drive. That is the warp drive, not a micro warp drive in this case. If you're warping away, you require less uh, capacitor in order to actually do so to get from A to B. Very, very useful for running away if things go a little bit peak tongue. But it's mainly that capacitor capacity and the power grid. The higher your power grid, the higher level gear that you can fit to it. One of the big differences between, say, a Mark V snub-nosed railgun and a uh, Corelli C-type small rifle, uh, small, uh, snub-nosed railgun isn't just the damage it does, but also the amount of power grid required. So frigate engineering kind of becomes the skill that dictates what level gear you can fit onto the ship, and it also helps you maintain all of those systems as active for a lot longer. Finally then, on the H1 Interceptor, you'll notice that the ship itself does not get any bonuses to weapon skills. It's purely from the Advanced Electronic Warfare and Advanced Frigate Command, but it is a railgun ship. Therefore, if you are going to be using it in a combat, uh, combative sense, then having skilled points uh, trained into small railgun operation and small railgun upgrade is obviously going to be useful. Uh, small railgun operation increases the railgun damage and the tracking speed of your railguns. Very, very useful if you're running snub-nosed up close and personal, TM, and need that tra high tracking speed in order to be able to hit your target uh, properly. Small railgun operation is a very useful skill there. Small railgun upgrade, on the other hand, if we have a look at this at the full level 5 variant, again increases the small railgun damage, this time by 15% rather than 20, um, but increases the accuracy fall off and the optimal range instead, which again for snub nosed is very useful as it means you can start applying that damage a bit better. And if you've got an if your ship doesn't hold orbit quite as well as the optimal range for snub nosed railgun might demand, this gives you a little bit of extra flexibility and leeway in actually applying that damage. The first fit that I'm going to showcase in this particular video for the Atron Interceptor is an up close and personal Captain Benzie special brawling build. Now of course you can see on screen here this has an offensive DPS of 325.09 which is absolutely monstrous for a frigate, alongside a defense of 3262, solid shield there of 740, good armor at 866 and 851 on the structure. That's thanks to me having things like frigate defense trained up as well. Yes, the main purpose here is to not be hit at all. I'm intending not to be hit, but I've got a nice little buffer there just in case I am. This fit is capacitor stable as long as I'm within Nosferatu range. Obviously, in the mid slots there, there is a Nosferatu that's going to be helping to feed this thing. And my cold flight velocity is 717.49 meters per second. 717 meters per second before activating any prop mods. That is, again, monstrous. We've also got a very fast warp preparation time here of 1.14 seconds. This means basically when you hit warp to a point, it's about 1.14 seconds from, uh, from a still motion, from being at zero meters per second, to aligning and jumping into warp. 1.14 is a very fast time. It makes it very difficult for someone to lock onto you, um, especially as well since you are immune to interdictor spheres. That is one of the key points that makes the Atron Interceptor absolutely invaluable for cargo running through Nullsec because you're immune to the bubbles and your warp preparation time is so ridiculously fast. That is of course assuming, as I said, that you're starting at uh, unmoving, at a full dead stop zero meters per second. If you're moving, then the warp preparation time will be longer as you have to slow down, realign, and then achieve warp in the new direction. 
Now, the way we actually get this fitted here is with three Corelli C-type small snub-nosed railguns. These are the highest DPS um, small weapon system in the entirety of EVE Echoes currently but they do have the downside of a abysmal optimal range and accuracy fall off. Even with the bonuses that the Atron Interceptor gives to accuracy fall off, that's an optimal range of two kilometers and an accuracy fall off of 3.93. Very, very short range. High DPS, short range. You do need to be right up close and personal, right up in their grill in order to be able to hit with these things. 100% effective at two kilometers, dropping to less than 50% effectiveness by time you're at six kilometers. Very narrow margin which your ship needs to be in. However, we do have an absolutely ludicrous tracking speed of 671. That means even with a micro warp drive active at close range, you will be able to hit your targets because they track that blasted quickly. Now talking about being close to your target, a Vrikalakas small energy Nosferatu is the first mid slot that we're going to be looking at. The optimal range here, normally 5.52 kilometers, that's thanks to me having skills in uh, advanced electronic warfare. The optimal range there of about five kilometers usually, of course, is more than we need when we're going to be orbiting at around the two to three kilometer margin anyway for the snub nosed railguns. So of course, we're gonna be orbiting around two kilometers. That will make our turrets 100% effective and we'll be inside the optimal range there of the small energy Nosferatu. So we're achieving maximum capacitor transfer there too. Now, having said that this is a fast ship, it's a small target, why on earth would I need stasis webifiers? I mean, heck, those, uh, th those snub-nosed railguns are gonna track anything no matter how fast it's moving. Ultimately, it's not for assisting with my snub-nosed. This is for either keeping something at range or for stopping it escaping. Because this build, spoiler alert, is using an afterburner, not a micro-warp drive, there are ships that can outpace it, so having a stasis webifier to help slow them down just brings them into the range where they're not going to escape the range of my guns. Plus, I can use that if I'm going up against a target. For example, if I'm going up against a Worm or a Tristan or heck, even bigger ship like a Vexa, I can actually set that web of fire on one of their drones and it will effectively keep that drone at about 13 kilometers whilst I deal with other things. That's referred to as drone screening. And you see me do it in the video uh, where I use uh, the Daredevil. Now, ultimately, that is a bit of a, it, it's a mid slot that you can swap out if you don't think you need that. I would still recommend it because it does just allow you to stop someone escaping as quickly, stop someone getting too close if they've got uh, like something powerful whilst you're working on something else. You can be taking out the Vexa and keeping the drones at range using that Weber fire, for example. The third and final slot then, of course, is a Mark VII Warp Scrambler. We've got an optimal range here of 13.66, thanks to the 15% increase from the skills relevant to the ship and this applies three points of warp jammer strength. There's not much in combat that's gonna be running away from that. And of course it will also switch off a micro warp drive. Now I'm using an afterburner, so I don't care if someone hits me with the scrambler. I care that if I hit them with the scrambler, not only am I putting that three, point, three points of warp jammer strength, I'm also deactivating any micro warp drive they may have. The afterburner is going to be enough for me. I'm then stopping them. If they've got webs, I can, uh, sorry, if they've got a, uh, an afterburner, I can web them to slow them down. If they're running a micro warp drive, I scramble them and then web them to hold them firmly in place. Now, as I said, spoiler alert, this means I'm using an afterburner, not a micro warp drive. Obviously, yes, the ship does get bonuses to micro warp drives and there are fits that will definitely utilize a micro warp drive better than an afterburner. However, for this particular fit, an afterburner is enough. It allows me to achieve a speed that is fast enough that I can achieve a high enough angular velocity that I'm not getting shot at whilst I'm at that two kilometer mark orbiting around something. It's a good enough fit without giving me the penalties to signature radius and without chewing off the top 25% of my capacitor. Very useful here to have the afterburner. I could, obviously the micro warp drive will give me a higher angular velocity, but it also chews off um, the top part of my capacitor and it can be switched off with a, uh, a warp scrambler. I'm going to be in scrambler range. I don't really want to risk that. So the afterburner is the better choice for me. Now to help this be a little bit more survivable, an all round damage control fits out the middle of the low slots here. That gives me 8.64% resistance to all of my statistics, shield, armor, and structure, whether that's electromagnetic, thermal, kinetic, or explosive across the board. And I can activate this for a, uh, a full 13 seconds 
and those bonuses will be boosted by 8 hundred percent that makes this ship very survivable for those 13 seconds excellent if you're approaching um, a new target and your angular velocity isn't quite where you'd like it to be or if you've just got a few more targets than you'd like in a pve encounter you can activate that to reduce the damage you take whilst you start thinning the herd so to speak the third and final slot then is a basic magnetic field stabilizer. Of course, this is the weapon upgrade low slot here um, for railguns. This gives a cold increase of 5% damage bonus increase and a 4.01% decrease to activation time. Straight up DPS increase for having this fitted. And I can activate it and that will give me 23 seconds of a 400% increase to the boost of activation time there and an additional 8.03% on the damage. Basically, if I absolutely need to delete something quickly, I can activate that and for 23 seconds I will be dealing extra damage, it then goes on cooldown for 60 seconds. Again, that low slot is a bit of an option for you. If you find that you are taking a bit more damage than perhaps you'd like, if you haven't trained up your afterburner skills or frigate, engine, uh, frigate command etc to quite the same level as I have and you're taking hits, you might like to put something like a small shield booster or a small armor repairer in there. Yes, I know, it's a Galente ship, that means armor repairer, right? Well, yes, yeah, 740 to 866. Yeah, you've got some nice statistics across the board here. I mean, heck, look at those resistances. Explosive is the only problem there. Um, small armor repairer is the one I would go for, but if you are shield trained, you probably can get away with it here on uh, shield tanking as well, in addition to the speed tank. So you could go for extra tank there, um, if you think that's going to be useful and necessary. You can also fit a micro warp drive here, makes it excellent for PvP, because you can jump into an anomaly, you spot someone at extreme range, you activate the micro warp drive whilst you close the distance, and when you're close enough to scramble them, you switch the micro warp drive off and switch to afterburner. You then speed tank with the afterburner, they probably hit you with a scrambler because they've seen how fast you're moving and you just go, <laughs> you thought I was using a micro warp drive. I was but I'm not anymore and you just proceed to rip them to shreds with your ridiculously high DPS. Now for the rig slots, yes obviously we now have the availability of going all the way up to tier 3 rigs. They're also about 150 million a piece which is quite frankly ludicrous and I'm not really willing to pay that um, on an interceptor that is a, a fairly throwaway ship for me as far as PvP goes. This is the kind of ship I like to fly at a target just to see what happens. Now if I can get a tier 1 rig for literally 7 million, a tier 2 rig for 70 million or a tier 3 rig for 150 million I'm just going to sit with the standard tier 1 rigs because frankly that DPS and those other stats are, ma are mad enough as it is. But what rigs have I fitted? Because of course, if you want to dump more cash into this, you can do. Railgun Collision Accelerator is the first one, basic increased damage bonus. The second one is a Railgun Burst Aerator. Again, one bur Burst Aerator, one Collision Accelerator is the best way to go if you've got two rigs. If you want three damage rigs, go two Burst, one Accelerator. The third one here is Burst Aerator. Who'd have thought that that's exactly what I'm preaching here? Two reduction to activation time, one increase to flat damage. That is your best overall way of doing this. Ultimately with those, the second burst aerator could be swapped for something like a Trimark Armor Pump if you want if you're going for that tanking route. Um, or even something like Shield Extender as well can work in the low slots there. Something for the survivability. Frankly, for me though, I prefer to go with the your most survivable when your target is dead approach with this particular ship. For the mechanical rigs then, we are looking first of all, long press, not a tap, at auxiliary thrusters. Again, these are fairly expensive, whether you just go for the standard Tech 1 rigs, or you shell out for Tech 2 or Tech 3. I had a single Tech 2 auxiliary thrusters lying around, so I put that one in, but Tech 1 is probably enough. Flight velocity adjustment, 15% increase. Nice to get you moving that little bit faster. Polycarbon engine housing reduces your inertia modifier, which allows you to accelerate faster, decelerate faster, and maintain a tight turning circle. Very useful. If you have one rig put on the uh, mechanical side of things, get the polycarbon engine housing on here first. If you've got the money to go for um, either a choice of Polycarbon Engine Housing 2 and Auxiliary Thrusters 1 or Auxiliary Thrusters 2 and Polycarbon Engine Housing 1, get the Polycarbon Engine Housing 2 first. Again, I've explained why I've got it the other way around. That's just due to what I had lying around. The Polycarbon Engine Housing is probably one of the most important rigs on this ship as it allows you to maintain that 2km orbit. 
Third and final then, a dynamic fuel valve. Since we're going to be running an afterburner or a micro warp drive 24-7 pretty much on this thing, we want to reduce the amount of capacitor that those propulsion systems actually chew. Dynamic fuel valve helps us to achieve that. This second fit is a full-on interceptor tackle fit. Basically, this is designed for group. PvP, whether it's just you and a couple of your mates going and hunting people, or whether it's uh, you as part of a full-on Nullsec fleet engagement, this is what is referred to as a full-on interceptor tackle fit. The aim of this essentially is that you pick a target, you get right up into it, you lock it down so that it cannot escape whilst the rest of your fleet then warps in and blows the ever-living crap out of it. Now this is achieved through the use of the warp scramblers and by utilising their bonuses. Now if we have a look here, normally at an interruptive warp scrambler, you'll see it's got an optimal range, in this case unfit, of 13.13 kilometers. Now if I actually fit that to the ship so that we've got two of them fitted on here, and then have a look at it, you'll see that that shoots up to 15.09. That is a key point here to the interceptor and why it has that additional range bonus. Because now I can orbit at 15 kilometers, and I can activate my interruptive warp scramblers, both of them, to apply eight points of warp scrambling to my target, and if they try to hit me with a warp scrambler back, if it's an if it's an interruptive or lower rank, uh, lower meta level, I'm going to be out of range of theirs, so that my micro warp drive can remain active. I can stay orbiting around them quite comfortably, um, whilst uh, holding them in position. I stay at 15 kilometers, which is enough for me to scramble them, but their warp scrambler is probably only about 13 and a half kilometers, therefore they can't reach me. Now for this as well, we then go up to something like the Corelli C-Type Small Rifled Railguns. Now I've put Corelli on here just to give you an idea of the kind of DPS it can do with these 217. Still not to be sniffed at, to be fair, but ultimately you probably want to go for fairly cheap ones on this because this is the kind of ship that is going to have a big, fat target painted on it. And if you do find that actually talking of targets painted on it, if someone uses a target painter, you can actually swap out of the micro warp drive and drop down to the afterburner here because we are running a double prop fit. Now that's ultimately the reason that we have the double prop here and we don't need uh, any form of tank particularly because yeah, we're not going to outlast any like proper suppressive firepower. If they do happen to scramble us, we can use the afterburner to get to a bit further range um, and then reapply from there. Or if they are, uh, as I said, if, the, if they're hitting you with something like a target painter, remember a target painter increases you by percentage. So the difference between a 27 meter signature radius and a 40, sign uh, 40 meter signature radius, when it goes up by 25%, that is a big, big difference between a 27 plus 25 and a 40 plus 25. So you can swap to the afterburner, um, still maintain a good enough speed, and just hold them in position there. At that point, you might just decide that actually I'm going to orbit at sort of like five kilometers and just screw that. But if you are holding at extra range, I'd recommend holding at that extra range. We then have a tracking disruptor in here. This can be a tracking disruptor or a guidance disruptor, depending on what target you're going up against. Ultimately, the aim here, as I said, is that I'm going to orbit at 15 kilometers. I'm going to activate my scramblers. You've got eight points of warp scram on you. You cannot hit me unless you've got the predator level warp scramblers, which let's face it, are bloody expensive. Um, and then I'm also going to completely screw with your turrets. I'm going to be going far. I'm outside of your scrambling and web range, and I'm making it harder for you to hit me by disrupting your turrets or your missiles, depending on what we're going up against. This is all about basically holding them in place, orbiting, and letting your friends do the damage. So the fact that those Corellis won't actually do all that much in the long run because of their tracking, ultimately, it's about surviving whilst the rest of your fleet, and you stick them down like a pinned bug, the rest of your fleet rips them to shreds. This third fit probably looks a little bit crazy at first glance, and can you even really call it a fit if there are no modules involved? Well, ultimately, what we're having a look at here is how to use the Atron Interceptor as a nullsec cargo runner. So yeah, as far as calling it a fit, we're just going to imagine here that those three mechanical slots are filled with cargo hold optimization rigs. I'm not about to go out and buy a load of cargo hold optimization rigs, replace all of these super expensive navigation rigs, only to then put the uh, navigation 
imagination rigs in again once I've finished recording this video. You're just going to have to use your imagination. So imagine I've got all those cargo hold rigs in place there. That gives us uh, the space to fit in all that juicy loot inside the Atron Interceptor's cargo hold. Now, the ship itself is immune to warp disrupt fields. That's whether, as I said, whether they are warp disrupt field generator uh, bubbles or whether they are interdiction sphere launcher bubbles. Either way, this ship is completely immune to them. And if you've got multiple of them on the field, you will still warp through multiple of them. You are totally immune. Yes, okay, there are then things like warp scramblers and warp disruptors, but here with no modules fitted, you can see if I go under navigation that the warp preparation time is 1.14 second from standstill. That means if I jump into a new system um, and I find myself inside an interdictor sphere gate camp, I'm already in the bubble, I've got the gate cloak on me. I then autopilot towards the next point, so I turn, the gate cloak drops, it's 1.14 seconds before I achieve warp and I exit that interdictor sphere. It is nigh on impossible for a ship to lock you in that time. It's not completely impossible. I need to stress it is not completely impossible. There are ships that can lock on faster than this. The point is you need to also account for the human element here. Someone needs to actually spot your ship, double tap it to lock on, and then lock on before you achieve warp in 1.14 seconds and off you go. There's not really much to say about this fit, I just wanted to showcase that if you're using an Atron Interceptor for Nullsec cargo running, you don't need anything other than the Atron Interceptor itself and those uh, cargo hold rigs. I wouldn't even bother with things like uh, the, the stabilization rigs. You don't need them. This is far uh, fast enough um, to achieve warp on its own before someone can lock onto you unless they are incredibly lucky and paying intense attention with a reaction speed that quite frankly means they should probably be playing uh, competitive level fighting games or something else. I thought it would be fun to showcase this interceptor in one of the new Tech 9 encounters. Basically, once you hit Tech Level 8, you can change your encounter, your news encounter list, to include Tech 8 and Tech 9. I think it's hard level. And so here we are, shameful quay for robbery, Tech Level 9. I'm going to lock onto the two Nemesis, because I know that Nemesis tend to, the small targets in these encounters tend to be the ones that run webs, and they run scrams. So I'm going to set up my orbits here to two kilometers start orbiting these targets with the afterburner active um, and then we're going to start applying damage to these nice and quickly. Snub-nosed railguns you saw, we've got very high DPS here, um, let's see how quickly these go down. Now there's Nemesis there, one shot, two shots, two shots and we're through the shields of a Tech 9 ship. One shot or two shots take us through the armor. Oh not quite, it's going to be three into, uh, into hull there, so that's five in total. Six takes us well into hull. Seven. Oh, are we going to get nine? No, we got it in eight. Eight hits to take out one of these. That is the kind of crazy damage we're doing. And yeah, we probably should put the Nosferati one as well. Um, it just means that every time I use the gyro, sorry, the uh, magnetic field stabilizer and the afterburner here, that we're just going to help keep that, uh, that capacitor topped right the way up. I mean, heck, you can see it barely takes a hit when I activate that MFS. 87%. Um, and rising, um, or yeah, that 89%, there we go. And down goes that second nemesis, and we start moving on to the other targets. And you can see I've barely taken any damage at all. I'm moving too fast, and I'm too small for these ships to be able to actually comfortably hit me. Let's go after the Celestis Cova Ops next. Three kilometer range, two kilometer range. There we are, and you can just see that their guns are not capable of tracking a ship this small and this fast. Now ultimately I can sit here and talk through this over and over and over again. I'm going to scrub ahead now to the point where um, we are going to ultimately have the change in waves. Because I know it's going to take a fair amount of time to get through that Megathron. That is a battleship and a fairly tanky one at that. Looks like we're just about to take out this Megathron. You can see how bored I've gotten at this point because basically I am now, I've changed the camera to have this perfect sort of thing so that the Megathron never actually goes off screen just so that I can watch it explode when I finally get rid of it. There we are, 400,000. What an explosion. Next wave appears. There we are. Now we've got here a catalyst. Catalysts definitely, and it's probably a catalyst interdictor as well. Yeah, there it is. Uh, catalyst 2 interdictor. 
These are fairly nasty ships. These are the ones that are going to scram you and do the real damage. So I'm going to set up onto that one, activate absolutely everything to delete this as quick as possible. And there we are. Look, there we go. Scrambler on the ship. Let's get rid of the, uh, the Scrambler, ASAP, Magnetic Field Stabilizer, doing its work there, really ripping through that catalyst. Um, the damage control unit meant I took very little damage on that approach, despite the fact that there's, what, seven, eight ships here at this point, um, all firing on me, and I don't have a good optimal uh, angular velocity. Sorry, it was six ships, there's now five left. I uh, didn't have a good angular velocity against all of them yet. There's a lot of ships coming from a lot of different angles. Obviously, you can't just orbit, and there we go. So, move on to the Nemesis. Can you see me in the distance? Where am I? Where am I? There I go. Woohoo! <laughs> How quick that is to orbit. It's insanely fast. Still taking a little bit of damage, but no real worries here. Um, as long as I don't hit armor, I don't have too much for concern. And in fairness, even once I hit armor, it's not a big problem, um, as you'll see in a moment. Again, what I'm going to do at this point is ultimately um, skip ahead in a second to the end of this wave, because there are four waves in this thing, and they do take an awful long time to go down. But essentially, I'm picking each target, and already now that we're down to four ships, you'll see that I've stopped taking damage. It's just those first four ships, that, uh, those first couple of ships that are problematic. I start taking a little bit of damage from those and the damage control unit, you save it for those moments when you're going to start taking some hefty damage. It pushes your resistances right up um, so you can survive that damage whilst you uh, whittle those targets down, which is why we start with the small ones. If you start with the small ones, you're getting rid of two or three ships very quickly rather than getting rid of a battleship takes a lot longer and you only get rid of one of them at a time. Um, just before we do swap though, Celestis Covert Ops, please someone explain to me what, what this ship is supposed to look like. It's horrific. I've described it previously as a vacuum cleaner that swallowed a banana, um, and I'm still not entirely sure what else we can do. They're pretty cool ships actually, I do need to get hold of one um, and showcase it in a ship fitting guide because they've got some really interesting abilities. But anyway, I'm pulling this one apart, let's skip ahead to the end of this wave, and we'll keep going through this to showcase its possibility. Here we are now coming towards the end of wave two. Again, it's a Megathron that I'm taking out slowly but surely. And you'll notice that all that damage I took to my shield has passively regenerated over time. By the time this new wave starts, I'm at full shields, full armor, and my damage control unit is ready for me to use again. Big explosion, love how that one looks. Now this wave, if I remember, is actually going to be a little bit problematic. I do take a lot of damage in this one. Um, I'm starting to look through the list now because there is an Interdict uh, Catalyst 2 on there. There it is. Um, alongside a couple of Nemesis 2s as well. Not only do those do quite a bit of damage, you can see I'm taking a fair amount of hits before I activate the damage control unit. I also have a Web of Fire on me, a Scrambler, two Sensor Dampeners, and two Energy Nosferatus. Now, the, the Web of Fire is actually the biggest threat here because that is slowing me down. Not as much as it used to. You'll see my flight velocity has dropped from about 1700 to 1400. It's still enough that I'm taking a bit more damage than I'd like to be taking. So we're going to get rid of that Quaif Rubber uh, Catalyst 2 um, Interdictor. That one goes down, the web goes with it. Next on the priority list is, of course, the Nemesis here, um, as that is the one that is scrambling me currently. And scrams are a problem. Even though I'm using afterburners, not micro warp drives, scramblers are still a problem because if things really go wrong with, if I'm not scrammed, at least I can flee to safety, repair up and come back for round two. If things go wrong when I'm scrambled, which I'm not anymore, thankfully, if things go wrong when I'm scrambled, different story. That's it. That's game over, man. Game over. <laughs> So anyway, with the Scrambler down now, I can start basically going up my usual target priority. I'm going to get rid of the E-War ones first, just because they're fairly annoying. It takes that few seconds extra for me to lock onto a ship. Not a big amount of time, because let's face it, I'm in an Atron Interceptor, which has over uh, 900 uh, meters signature as the signal there which allows me to lock on nice and quickly, but we are going to slowly pull apart that Celestis 2 Covert Ops, and again, I'm going to skip ahead to the end of this wave, and where we'll look at what happens as we go into wave 4, and then finally finish off this encounter. So it turns out I was wrong, there are actually only three waves in this, and this Quaif Robber Dominix is going to be the final ship to put an end to this entire encounter. It's a Tech 9 encounter, it's taken me about an hour and five minutes to hit this point. Yes, you can do this faster in a cruiser or a battle cruiser, but 
Those are going to uh, heck. A battle cruiser is going to cost you two hundred million to buy, plus another hundred million to fit. So that's three hundred to three hundred and fifty million um, worth of ship in order to do this kind of encounter that little bit faster. And if you jump into Nullsec and you get caught in a gate camp, congratulations, that is your ship gone. Here we have a ship that cost me less than fifty million to make and less than fifty million on top of that to fit. So you're looking at about hundred million um, in this ship in total that can still do that encounter. Yes, you might be able to do it faster, but I can still do it, and I can survive Nullsec better than you can. As for PvP, I've not been able to find some decent targets to properly showcase this, because everyone seems to have completely run away from Lowsec. Um, at the moment, Lowsec piracy is almost impossible right now. Systems like Tama are just devoid of anyone. There's no one running the actual uh, combat anomalies anymore, and I kind of miss having the Halloween event ones those were excellent to jump into and then just camp, wait for someone to come in and blow them up. Not getting much viability here. So I've done a couple of tests against people um, in Catskull and Void, um, where we've done sort of to hull PvP on this kind of thing. And this is definitely a viable build for that. It just, it didn't strike me at the time as exciting footage. I was hoping to get something a bit more exciting and like genuine PvP related, um, actual proper PvP where the other guy was trying to kill me and I was trying to kill them. But you can see why it takes a bit of time, even with the insane amount of DPS that the snub nosed kick out, 835 damage per whack here, 619 there. It's, it's quick damage and it's high damage. It's just these ships have insane amount of tank to them. Um, we are slowly getting to the point where this Dominix is about to go down in an explosion and end this entire encounter for me. As I said, it's about one minute five, one minute seven that the entire encounter takes from uh, the first shot fired to the ship exploding and me getting the encounter itself. Now it's about a 7 million encounter, um, you'll see that at the end of this it pops up I think 6,650,000 after tax. Um, it's about a 7 million encounter, so 7 million isk in an hour, plus on top of that all of the loot and the bounties. You'll see when this uh, Dominix goes down, I think it's 450,000 isk bounty, the, uh, the, the, the bounties here were ticking for literally 2-3 million a piece. It's not a small amount of isk that you get from doing a mission like this. Yeah, your storylines have gotten harder, but the fact that these encounters can be doable in something like an Atron Interceptor Frigate just goes to showcase. And then, of course, you've got all of this loot here to grab too. Anyway, folks, that about wraps up everything I want to say here about the H1 Interceptor. I hope you've enjoyed this video. It's a ship that I'm absolutely loving to fly. Whether you go for the combat version or you go for the cargo running, let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one in the comment section below. Otherwise, thanks for watching to the end. Happy sailing and see you in New Eden.